So I'm happy to uh, have here uh, Ryan White, who is a labor lawyer, labor and employment lawyer here in Toronto at, um, okay, I better not say the top labor firm in Toronto <laughs> because this afternoon we have Steve Barrett coming from Goldblatt Partners. So, but I'm going to go out and say that uh, the two top labor law firms in Ontario are uh, Cavaluso and Goldblatt Partners. And we've got um, partners from both firms joining us today. And Ryan Wright is from the law firm that's in the cool part of town on College Street. Um, and uh, so Ryan's a partner there. And Ryan does uh, a lot of actually really interesting uh I would say even kind of test type, I don't know if you refer to them as test cases, but interesting cases um, that uh, are worthy of discussion and um, happen to get quite a bit of media coverage. So Ryan is now one of the little, uh, I don't say little, one of the one of the labor law stars in the country. Uh, and this case that we're going to talk about today, Fudoro, um, got international attention. Um, because it was one of the first cases that clearly found that gig workers are employees and covered by uh, an important labor statute, right? So they are really interested in this in the United States and in Europe uh, and Australia as well. So I'll take your face down here um, and I'm gonna put up uh, just as background wallpaper, the Fudoro decision, um, which I wanna note you know it's going to be a really interesting decision when it opens with when Harry Arthurs introduced. How great is that? I, I've never met Matthew Wilson who wrote this, but he's written some pretty interesting decisions. Uh, um, and so, um, so I thought what we do, like I've I've assigned them uh, both the case or at least parts of the case, the the analysis part. It's a long decision because the facts are so complicated. Um, and I also assign them your little write-up for the Canadian Law of Work Forum blog, which summarized it. But I thought uh, I'd like you to walk th through some of the decision, but I thought maybe we'd begin. I'd kind of interview you a little sure. bit. Uh, sure. Because I, I'm interested in, uh, like, when the, I told them earlier that you know, one of the first cases I ever worked on was the taxi cases in the 90s with your firm where Jim Hayes mm -hmm. was the lead lawyer and I was uh, working for uh, the retail wholesale department store union in the early 1990s, um, organizing taxi drivers. Um, and I still remember one night uh, when I was out with the organizers and it was about midnight and we were at Jane and Finch uh, which is actually near York University. But it can be a bit of a dodgy neighborhood uh, at late at night. Um, and we were approaching a bunch of cab drivers at Jane and Finch Mall. Um, and I remember the organizer saying to me, get ready to run. And I'm like, what the hell? And, and his point was, you know, you go approach the cab drivers and some of them uh, were really happy to talk to you because they were interested in being in a union and others would be very angry because they thought they were independent contractors and the last thing they wanted to do was be in a union and they would get really angry. So you had this real high tension of emotions there. Um, but what I'm interested, so we flash forward now to 2019 or 2018, whenever this first came to you, and you learn about an organizing campaign for Uber, for a Fudoro bike couriers. Most of them are bike couriers, right? You can be in cars as well, right? But most of them are on bikes. Yeah, that's correct. And so what do you, like, what's your thought at the beginning when this first comes to you about whether, you know, whether they're going to be employees or not? Um, so it actually, it came to me really early. Um, I had worked previously with one of the, the postal worker uh, organizers on the file kind of when I actually back when I was at, at York um, they had been an organizer there and uh, I was in law school and so they reached out to me um, you know maybe in about February of 2018 and we put in the application in July and that's kind of you know an uncommon lead up in the sense that normally you kind of find out about the application you know a few days beforehand when your client says you know where are you going to be on Thursday are you in the office and um, 
you know, certainly my, I mean, my view right off the bat with, you know, I think that there's, there's some nuance and some differences when you look at the different statutes. You know, my view, at least under the Labor Relations Act, was that we had a very strong case right off the bat. I, you know, I think there's, um, we can talk about this in a bit more detail, but I was relatively familiar with the case law. I'd done some other dependent contractor cases because it is a common issue that comes up. Um, I work for the Teamsters and the Teamsters have a lot of trucking divisions where that does come up. You know, trucking was kind of one of the classic um, areas of, uh, um, kind of the dependent contractor workforce that Harry Arthur's identified way back in the 60s. So I was familiar with it. And uh, I, you know, I think right off the bat, I thought, you know, the, the, generally speaking, the way that the Labor Board has looked at things under the Labor Relations Act, it tilts in favor of a finding of dependence. Um, and, you know, Fedora was, I think, kind of picked in part because it had some, some elements of their business model, um, you know, that kind of angled more in that direction, right? They, you know, Uber is very much this kind of, uh, uh, I want to say dystopian, but that's being hyperbolic. But, you know, with Uber, it's very much you and the app. And with Fedora, it's kind of funny. It's, you know, you interface with the app, but underneath it, there's a lot of real people who are working, say, in in the dispatch area and things like that. So, you know, Fedora, I, when I when I first found out of it, it sounded a lot more similar to your old taxi cases, you know, than it did, um, you know, someone who was simply just talking to a computer. Right. Um, and then, so you you apply, mm -hmm. uh, you send in the application, and then you you have to know that the response is going to be that there are no employees. That's correct. And that was actually really where we spent most of the time, you know, when we were talking in February, and I think this is maybe what comes up with the, with the Wagner model, but is that the stress up front was, was never about um, are they dependent contractors. The stress was very much knowing that Fedora was going to say, you know, they're not employees, um, but also, uh, you know, that kind of brings it into the numbers issue. And the stress was always over numbers. You know, if, if we could get them in as employees, who are we talking about? Okay, so let's just pause for a second because we've been talking about the Wagner model and um, we have a mix of students, Ryan. We've got, you know, people who are Canadian labor lawyers and people who are new to Canada and people who are not lawyers. And so we, I always want to pause and make sure that everyone understands what we're talking about here, right? So when we talked yesterday about the Wagner model and how it works, uh, we said that it sets up a competition right that the union has to show that it has majority employee support right and so it's a fraction right the it's it's the and the numerator is the number of workers who want collective bargaining who, who want the union to represent them and the denominator is the total number of people who are in the bargaining unit and so what ryan's saying here is the the big issue that everybody knew was coming apart from the question of whether the people are employees at all let's assume they're employees, um, the, the more challenging practical question is how many Fedora drivers are in the bargaining unit? Like how many, how many people are actually working for Fedora in the bargaining unit is the city of Toronto? Uh, it was Toronto and Mississauga. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So all employees of Fedora in the cities of Toronto and Mississauga, right? And then, so if you get a company like Fedora, where people are coming and going, right? Presumably, Ryan, you guys really, how did you even guesstimate how many there were? I mean, so they, uh, there are all sorts of, of things you do, maybe legitimate and less legitimate. I think they had, um, you know, I think there were some pieces of paper or maybe electronic documents that occasionally would find their way out of the Fedora office and into CPW's hands. There were, you know, people who were in the office who were who were interested in unionizing. There were a lot of, you know, just on the ground organizing, um, you know, kind of setting up shop just in main intersections with with flyers. But um, it, there was no one easy way. Like that was that was a significant source of stress was trying to figure out just what that underlying number was. I remember it in the old days, uh, I'm sure this still happens, but certainly in the old days before phones, uh, employers would often post schedules up on bulletin boards. And when there's a union organizing campaign, those schedules would mysteriously go missing. Yeah, something like that. Happened, show yeah. up, they would show up in the union lawyer's office. Yeah. Right? And, and you, would never, you would never say, where did you get this from? Because you didn't want to know, right? But 
Um, but because the union has, is trying to figure out, well, how many employees are there in the bargaining? What's the denominator going to be? Because you need to know that in order to know whether you're going to get a majority. So you're, you've got a, a rough estimate of what you think the denominator is. Um, and then you'll know how many employees you have union cards from. Mm -hmm. And so at some point you have a discussion with the, with the union that you're ready, that you think you have enough. Sort of actually went the opposite direction here in the sense that they were waiting. And then uh, Fedora got a large contract with the LCBO in August, which, you know, seems so innovative pre pandemic and now seems so normal, but, uh, Oh, so by the way, August. LCBO is the Ontario government uh, alcohol monopoly. So yeah, yeah sorry, so go ahead, gets this huge deal with with the LCBO, and we, you know, so all of a sudden the the, you know, we didn't know when we were going to go, and all of a sudden the union kind of came to me and said, you know, they're about to hire 100, 200 people. This the is the denominator kind of, is about to of, get much bigger. Yeah, it's kind of now or never. To put it in in in, in um, context. You know, we thought there were about 850 people in the bargaining unit, which is a very big bargaining unit in a contemporary sense, right? Like yeah. there are not a lot of, of 850 uh, uh, person applications at the labor board. Fedora thought it was closer to 1,200. So it's an enormous gap of, of 400 people. And, you know, we actually thought that, that uh, you know, that number could be even higher, but 100 or 200 higher if they were to start hiring for the LCBO. So um, they kind of said, look, you know, it's kind of, uh, where I mean, union organizers always want more cards, right? So um, it, you generally try to put in an application with, they say, 60%. And here it was more right around 50. I think that worried them a great deal, but they just said, look, it's got to be now or never. Okay. So you've got somewhere in, I don't know, the uh, presumably the decision never says how many cards you have, but it's somewhere in the range of 400, 425, 430, 450, something like that. Yeah, it was right. It was yeah. That's actually right in the yeah. And you're right in the range. So you're thinking you've got what you do with certain cards. It was right in that range. Right. Yeah. And then there. And then the way this works, um, I remember from the taxi cases, you end up with this huge list, and then there's all of these challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, who's in? Who's out? You're probably in a place like Fedora. You probably got people who are on the employer's list who haven't delivered for weeks or months, right? But they're still on the list. Yeah, so Fedora's response was basically anyone who'd been there in the last uh, 12 months, they put on the list. You know, the catch, and this is this comes back to the, the discussion on the Wagner Act, but is that there's a huge amount of turnover on these lists, right? The Fedora, during the course of the case, had estimated that the average, um, you know, tenure of a, of a driver was, you know, two months or less. Um, and that was supported by the data, right? A lot of long-term riders, but a lot of people who picked it up, it's very difficult work, would do it for two weeks and then just disappear. Um, so in Fedora's case, they just took every, you know, if you had worked for a few weeks in January, and keep in mind we're applying in August, if you worked for two weeks in January and quit because driving around in a, a bicycle in January in Toronto was not a fun thing to do, um, you were on their list. And of course we were saying, you're not sufficiently connected to the workplace. Let's get the numbers more manageable. Maybe you could explain uh, what's the test. So when, sure. how do you, what's the test the labor board applies to decide if someone was an employee for the purposes of the, of this fraction? Sure. And that's, I mean, that's a bit fluid right now. It just, uh, you know, there's a, a, a kind of a companion application to Fedora, which is over a very small subset of Uber drivers, the Uber black program that's going on at the labor board now, um, where they kind of elaborated upon the test. Um, but generally speaking, um, you know, for a long, long time, what the labor board did was a so-called 30 and 30 test, which was if you'd worked in the last 30 days or if you were scheduled in the next 30 days, you were in. And in the mid 80s, the board kind of gave up on that and said that's a bit too uh, mechanical. And that create, that then creates a great deal of stress for us because, you know, the, the case law was mixed. The board's test is you have to have a sufficient connection to the workplace. The idea is that this is a, an important decision and so the people who are connected to the workplace should make that important decision in respect of unionization. But the board has never really defined just what that, you know, what's the cutoff. Um, and so, you know, our position was that Fedora had buried in the contract that if you didn't ride uh, within a four-week period, they reserved the right to, to take you off the list. 
right? Because Fedora was always engaged, you know, they wanted to keep their riders happy. So they were engaged in kind of a management of their workforce. And one of the ways they do that is they would send you an email if you hadn't worked in four weeks and say, it looks like you don't really want to be doing this. Um, we might let you go. So we always said that was the cutoff, right? The board has, has kind of further elaborated on that in Uber and has said there's no hard and fast deadline, but you kind of have to look at the workplace and see whether or not there's kind of a natural cutoff period to say, you know, is it two months? Is it a month? I think the board's probably going to look around two to three months. I think we could have won on one month here. We didn't have to fight over it, but we could have won on one month, I think, because of Fedora's particular policies. But in the case of Uber, where there was no cutoff, you know, the board tried to say, look, after about two months, that's where we're going to draw the line. Um, but it, that was a great deal of stress because the board is not consistent on that. There was one teacher case where it was a year. But I think generally speaking, what the board will say is if you do work in the two months before an application, we're going to say you're entitled to vote. Right. And just um, to the class, uh, circling back to some of our discussion last night, just pay attention because it'll come up again later today. Uh, what we're talking about here is you've got, say, 450 employees of Fedora who are trying to get access to collective bargaining. But whether they can or cannot depends upon how many people end up on that list um, and whether ultimately the 450 is a majority. Um, and so the point is, uh, if they lose, if it turns out that um, 460 people do not want collective bargaining and only 450 do, under the Wagner model, those 450 people have no legal right to collective bargaining. And so one of the questions that is being debated is, well, is that a good system? Right? Should the 450 who want to bargain collectively with Fedora be able to and have some sort of legal protection? Whereas under the Wagner model, it's winner, it's it's majority rules and it's winner take all. It's all or nothing. Okay. That's why you can see just listening to Ryan explain the process, how many legal issues uh, are naturally tied to the Wagner model, just trying to figure out the fraction, right? Who even gets to, to participate in the vote um, is such a hugely important legal technical issue that it becomes, you know, Ryan will spend hours and hours and hours and hours thinking about these issues and arguing them, because that's just a function of the Wagner model. Right? Uh, okay, so um, before we get to the decision, is there anything that happened during the hearings that was sort of noteworthy or unusual or worth commenting on in terms of the process of the hearing itself? Yeah, I think what was interesting with this one is it was we managed it far more than I normally would in the sense that, you know, and I guess this, this comes back to um, some of the quirks of the Wagner model and the specific issues of the gig economy. You know, keep in mind that turnover. Um, if you, the way to think about it is to think of it this way, you know, it took, it took about a year to get a um well, that's not true. It took, it took eight months to get a decision on the dependent contractor issue, um, relatively speaking. You know, end of July, we put in an application and we get a decision at the end of February. And it took until the middle of June to then get a decision on the certificate, so 10 months. And, you know, that was partially driven by, by Fedora closing down. They kind of gave up on a few arguments. Um, so I think we were always anticipating it would take about a year or so. And if you've got a workplace in which you've got people turning over every month or two months, uh, you know, that means that you, you kind of put your pin in, in uh, um, or, you, or you kind of put a pin on the calendar for July 31st, you know, you kind of freeze the bargaining at that time and say, what's the percentage of card signers versus workers. But then when you actually get your certificate, suddenly it's a year and a half later and you're having to go and bargain with a completely different workforce. And we always knew that bargaining was going to be a challenge which brings me back to the hearing. The idea was we wanted to get this done as quickly as possible. Um, I mean, you always want these things to be done quickly, but it was a particular concern here. And so, you know, one of the things we did was there was a real push to use representative witnesses, right? So rather than calling 800 some odd witnesses or even 10 or 15 to say, look, we're gonna give you a sampling. And we tried to be as honest as possible. We gave them the worst possible workers so that we could not be accused of cherry picking. Sorry, great workers in the sense of people. Say, people what do you bad, mean by the worst yeah, workers? No, no, but bad, bad facts for us. People who worked for a lot of different companies, 
you know, people who, who had other jobs. And so, you know, could be argued we're not dependent on Fedora, those kinds of things. And, you know, we pushed really hard to, um, you know, we put all of our evidence went in in writing and then was cross-examined on rather than, you know, trotting witnesses up and having me ask them questions. You know, we had these 30 or 40 page affidavits that people would sign um, with, you know, Fedora dispatch logs. So we we did a, a lot of, of work up front to try and say, look, how can we get this done quickly? Uh, I think alternate chair Wilson, to his credit, did it very quickly. And again, that's where there's a disconnect, I think, between maybe lawyers' time, timelines and the, and the real world. Like, you know, uh, eight to 10 months for decision seems like a very long time. I mean, it's very, very quick by by labor board standards, because especially in a case like this where there's some really significant issues. But so there was, you know, before we actually get to the substance of the decision procedurally, there was a whole lot of work going on to try and, and get this in front of the board uh, quickly and to try and respond to the, the specific issues of this workplace. Okay, so let's jump ahead then. So what, uh, I know this is really complicated, we don't have a lot of time, but maybe you could quickly kind of summarize what the argument was for the dependent contractor, your argument and what their response was. Sure. And so I think, you know, our argument was really that, um, uh, you know, I don't want to be overly simplistic, but it really kind of flowed through control that, that Fedora had a great deal of control over people. They had control in terms of how they scheduled uh, workers. They had control in terms of, you know, uh, like I said earlier, when workers were kind of forced out of the workplace, that they weren't working off enough. Um, you know, they control over how you did the work in the sense that riders were free to, to pick uh, the specific route they did, but Fedora was the one that was out there getting the customers and then uh, um, kind of linking the customers up to the, to the couriers and so on. So we said, look, you know, Fedora kind of does all this, the, this um, their model is, is something that looks a lot like employment. And, you know, the key argument we kind of had to come back against was, and I think this is something that takes place a great deal in the, the so-called gig economy, and I think it's something that that was somewhat unique about this decision is, you know, even more so than other previous dependent contractor cases, uh, and this was kind of the crux of Fedora's argument. Um, people work for kind of multiple different platforms, right? And they will, uh, you know, as a as a rider, you'll have you know Uber uh, Eats and DoorDash or Skip the Dishes and Fedora all on your phone at once, and you know you're you're kind of allowed to do that. You're allowed to just simply pick up your phone and kind of cycle through them. And you pick whoever has, you know, the best delivery at that time, right? The deliveries are paid out on the basis of kind of internal algorithms that look at demand and look at distance and things like that. And so, you know, Fedora kind of said, look, these are really, these aren't workers. They're more little mini entrepreneurs who are out there trying to, to toggle between different apps. And we said, um, you know, our kind of counter to that was that it's not all that different. Um, from normal casual workers or say workers who work for a variety of different restaurants or things like that. Um, I think the smartphone certainly makes the turnaround time much more quickly in the sense that, you know, normally the idea is I may work, uh, you know, I work in long-term care, for example, to pick something that's come up with, with COVID, um, you know, maybe that I work as a, a personal support worker for three different homes, but on any given day, I'm just in one home. And then the next day, you know, I know that I'm, I'm on the schedule somewhere else in, Fedora that was sped up with the smartphones, right? It was really that you could be working for Fedora for an hour one morning, and then suddenly Uber has a real demand and they bump the rates up and you'd move over to Uber. So Fedora's argument was there's an element of control and um, kind of entrepreneurial spirit in terms of trying to, to pick uh, different companies. And we said, you know, none of that really is all that compelling. That in the end, uh, they really just look like kind of part-time or casual workers um, but with some some small quirks related to the technology. And so um, what does the board ultimately decide? Why don't you, uh, hopefully the, the students have read it, but why don't you give sure. your, you know, quick synopsis? So, you know, the, the, the key thing I think to start with there is that the way that the board looks at this, and it's kind of a, a, both a good thing and a bad thing, is the labor board loves non-exhaustive list. So the board has a long-standing uh, test for dependent contractors, which is, if I remember correctly, a 10-factor list, uh, which are really just, you know, often different ways of talking about control. Um, and, you know, the factors, it's really in many ways just taking the ABC test you looked at before the break, 
and, and just kind of teasing it out in a little bit more detail. And in terms of the key issues, you know, what the board found was, is that, you know, one, these are workers who very much have their, you know, day-to-day -day structured by Fedora, right? They don't go out and bid on clients themselves. Fedora goes and gets the clients and then connects them with the couriers. Um, they don't set the prices, right? Fedora um, both sets the prices that the restaurants are paying, that the members of the public are paying, but also then what they're paying the riders and the drivers. Um, and so that's it, you know, there, there's the control. But these are people who are, you know, Fedora, as much as Fedora and Uber and others say, look, we're just a technology company. We're just setting people up. You know, we're essentially just connecting people who want to do business, these independent contractors and members of the public who want to do business. You know, we're just the platform or the forum and they're, we're connecting them. The board said, that's not true, right? Your, your fundamental business is delivering food. And the way that you deliver the food is using these individuals. So they're integrated into the business. Um, and, you know, the board found that, that sure, it's true that people go and work elsewhere. And I think that's what's really unique about the case. I think it is the first case that deals with dependent contractors for a very, very casual workforce, a very mobile workforce. Um, but the board said that, you know, sure, you may go back and forth between different companies, but that's not all that different from someone who, you know, particularly in a contemporary economy, is kind of grinding with a bunch of different companies um, in order to kind of piece together a, a, a full-time uh, work week. And it didn't change the fact that when you're interfacing with those different companies, they had all the control. And if you suddenly switched over to Uber, you know, you couldn't go to Uber and say, look, you know, if you don't give me a better rate, I'm going to go and drive for Fedora on the next delivery. That it was just a bunch of different companies saying, here are your options. You pick one. Um, but, you know, it's not all that different from someone who says, you know, they work in a restaurant and says, look, you know, I've got two options. I can either work, you know, the, the lunch shift in the middle of the day on a weekend or a weekday or I can work, you know, the Sunday morning brunch shift, or I can work the Saturday morning or Saturday night shift rather. And you kind of, you know, pick it based on what you think is going to get you the most tips or the most business, that kind of stuff. But that's not all that different from using your smartphone to pick between them. So the board ultimately says, look, there's control and there's integration. Um, and, and as a result, they look more like employees, which is really what the labor board's test comes down to under the labor relations act. They look more like employees uh, than they do business people. Right. And then, um, so you win, and then uh, you'd already taken the vote, right, before yeah. all this litigation, and it's sitting in a sealed box somewhere yeah. at the board, right? And then, were you there when they counted? So it was an electronic vote, so it actually was oh, sitting in, a, in, a, in like a metaphorical box, okay. um, which means that they didn't actually, uh, like... There's some satisfaction in, in actually going into a room, right? They open up the box, you kind of look inside of it, yeah. they count it out. You're looking, trying to look at the stacks as you go. Now yeah, I was there at, at the taxi one. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's also a lot of fun. It's very stressful. In a room and it's two big piles, yes and no. And uh, both sides are really tense, hoping their pile gets bigger. And so now that yeah, those days here, are gone, I guess. Yeah, well, all that happened here was there was about a week, right? You know, we finally got to the point where we were going to get a vote, and there was just a week where I spent you know, uh, in, in June, kind of emailing the labor board saying, have you counted yet? Have you counted yet? And really it was just waiting for them to push a button and then they just send you a report. So it's, you know, you don't, you don't get the kind of like, all right, where things are going well, you know, it's not like election night. It's like, uh, right. where you can kind of like follow the results as they come in. It's just like, you open up your email and you kind of process it. Um, I mean, in the end, uh, I mean, CUPW had done such a good job organizing and because, Fedora kind of eventually conceded to our test around, you know, the the one month cutoff. Um, you know, we had a pretty good idea who was voting, and I think they won eighty eight percent of the the vote in the end, right? So it was pretty clear, um, but it was still stressful. Okay, so eighty eighty one percent or whatever it is um, vote for um, the union. Correct. Uh, so the union wins. The union gets a certificate from the labor board saying you are now the exclusive represent, representative of all Fudoro drivers in Mississauga and Toronto. Mm -hmm. And then uh, how much longer after that do you learn that they're shutting down the entire company? Well, this is where it was all jumbled up, right? So we actually, we got the certificate after they shut down. Oh, right. Because um, okay. they, um, uh, they announced on April 27th that they were shutting down. At that point in time, we were still fighting over the numbers um, and fighting over, um, you know, was it was it eleven hundred ninety one people? Was it eight hundred ninety two? You know, what was the act? What was the 
the uh, the, the denominator. And um, so, you know, we felt good about our numbers, um, but it was still in the midst of that fight where, you know, uh, they made that announcement. They emailed every courier, said you've got two more weeks to go. And, um, you know, so it was a bit bittersweet when we got the certificate because at that point in time, everything had shifted to try and, and uh, uh, you know, get something for, for the couriers who in the middle of a pandemic were now going to find themselves uh, out of work. Right. And you file an unfair labor practice complaint alleging that the closure is due to the outcome of the campaign. And that settles, right? What's the settlement structure? So the settlement structure, I have to go back and think about that it. Public? Like, but in oh, terms okay. of, but it is, I mean, it is, it's certainly. Um, I thought I read about it in the paper, but. Yeah, yeah, no, I made it into the paper. There is, um, you know, in the end, they, they, um, they did agree, you know, we kind of agreed to disagree on the question of, uh, um, because keep in mind, they're dependent contractors and therefore employees for the Labor Relations Act. Fedora then didn't concede that they were then, say, uh, employees for the purposes of the Employment Standards Act, which is kind of one of the main disconnects of this whole process is you're, you're spending all of this time um, fighting over whether you're an employee for the purposes of unionization, but with the idea of going to the bargaining table, and eventually once you get to the bargaining table, you may have to fight it all over again. And so, um, which we I think would make sense to come back to as a, as a broader topic to discuss, but in terms of the, you know, the settlement, what that meant was, you know, kind of no one pushed that issue forward to fight definitively, um, under the Employment Standards Act, you know, whether they were employees or not, but Fedora was able to provide some compensation to people that modeled that, or it was modeled kind of off of what they would have gotten if they were, a, you know, if, if any other company went bankrupt. And so we were able to get some compensation. And I think a significant amount of compensation for, for the riders who were, were kind of now in, uh, you know, would be now in May, when they shut down on May 11th, would now be in the kind of peak pandemic when they were, um, you know, really kind of a key part of the economy uh, in Toronto, um, but now without work. Right. Um, I have at least one more question. I'm keeping an eye on the clock here, but do any of you have questions for Ryan? We'll sort of pause here and see if anyone wants to ask Ryan anything. No, not seeing any hands. Okay, well, put your hand up if you want to ask him something. One thing, Ryan, that I, I was interested, or that I'm interested in, is, is whether you or a union or, you know, just this idea of let's, so you'd won. Um, and let's assume they didn't close. Mm -hmm. And you, you're now in bargaining. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Fedora position is basically, well, um, we're not employees under the Employment Standards Act. Uh, so, and you're trying to bargain at that point, you're basically, you know, your starting point maybe is, is bargaining, trying to get employment standards coverage at least, like you want at least minimum wage and at least overtime pay. But I'm just wondering, like either, you know, in your own mind or whether, I don't know, there would actually even been discussions, but what sorts of things do you think they were going to be focused in on bargaining is one question. So I, I, other question is, I'll, I'll ask two, and then you can address either or both. But it, let's say Fedoro takes a really hard line. Um, had you thought, uh, you like, how do you think a strike would work? Like, you know, at this point, right? Like, this is, like, I go back again to my taxi where that all, like, it was, it was huge celebration because they won. But really the bargaining and the may hanging on to that bargaining unit turned out to be a much tougher battle and hmm. they're all decertified now it's mm -hmm. just such a difficult thing and and fedora and the gig workers might even be harder because the way people come and go and short term anyways those are just are my general thoughts of what you know what do you think would have happened next and within the wagner model system yeah, so I think I think I can make a pretty well-educated guess because something similar had happened with CUPW about eight or nine years earlier where they had engaged in a campaign to certify bike couriers, they were like the people who shuttle uh, you know, litigation documents back and forth between lawyers in downtown Toronto and you know, deliver uh, flowers and so on. And CUPW had won there, and then they went off to uh, bargain, and bargaining fell apart and didn't complete because... Um, you know, the employer said, okay, well, fine, you're, you're dependent contractors, the purposes of the act. And in that case, actually, the employer didn't really contest it. Uh, 
but you're not employees. So, it, you know, to the extent that your first um, bargaining proposal included vacation, well, we don't think you're entitled to vacation. And to the extent that you're talking about things like overtime and the like, we don't think you're entitled to that. And, you know, the problem is the first contract arbitration system in Ontario is broken. Um, the idea being that if, if you kind of get to an, uh, an impasse, you would be able to go to the labor board and say, well, can someone break the tie? Um, and, uh, you know, that doesn't really work very well in Ontario. It worked briefly kind of okay um, in 2018 when the Liberals made some changes. But, um, and so you just kind of, you get to this impasse, you've got a workforce who's very hard to strike because there's no kind of one gathering place you know, there's kind of no one kind of choke point that you could, you know, go and pick it. And in the case of bike couriers, it just meant that they, we went to an impasse and eventually there was enough turnover that the workforce said, well, we don't really have much of a connection to you anymore. And they decertified. And that was always my concern with Fedora. And we were trying to think of ways that we could litigate the employment standards issue up front. Um, you know, we actually were thinking about filing complaints when it looked like we were going to win at the, the vote. So we can have those teed up for bargaining, but that's the real problem, right? Is that the the way that um, I think this the, the system works in Ontario now is, you know, you have uh, I think there's at least five different tests for are you a dependent contractor, an employee, or uh, an independent contractor, and um, you know they're kind of distinct from a legal perspective. But once you actually get into the workplace, they kind of all run together, and so you know, you know there's one test for getting the union in. And then suddenly there's a slightly different test because um, the way, you know, the ESA, of course, works, the Employment Standards Act works in Ontario is it kind of becomes the floor of any collective agreement as well. It gets read into every collective agreement. And so if you can't even agree on what the floor is because you can't agree as to whether or not that even applies, you're kind of stuck. And you could be very, very far apart, right, and, and have to go back and litigate more. And, of course, that makes takes more time. There's more turnover. Um, so I, I, I think CPW is so well organized here. I'm confident they would have gotten a deal in the end, but that to me was always, you know, I'm trying to think of the analogy, but it like, you know, it's like climbing a big hill on your bike is, is like, that's getting certified. But as you're doing it, you're kind of looking at a hill that's twice as big, uh, and you can tell it's coming. And it's like, so you get to the top of the first hill, you you know, your body kind of rests and you sigh of relief, and then you just start pedaling again. And I think that was going to be the real the real issue. And I think that's the real flaw potentially. And hopefully the Uber case is successful in the end. Um, and, there, and, and we'll get a chance to see how bargaining works. But I think that's really one of the, the key issues is like, you know, um, and that's where I think the ABC test comes up because I think the test, the Labor Relations Act has kind of applied or what the Labor Board has applied there is much clearer then say the test that applies if you're fighting over whether or not the Employment Standards Act applies, um, where there's not all that much guidance and it's a bit less settled. Um, so, I, you know, it's very possible you could be a dependent contractor for the Labor Relations Act, but then not a dependent contractor for the, or not an employee for the purposes of, you know, say vacation pay and, and the kinds of minimum standards. So, um, yeah. and then, and, and in terms of a strike, I don't know what the, you know, what the answer is. I, CPW had built up a fantastic um, campaign. They were, you know, even when we were fighting at the labor board, they were mobilizing and doing petitions. When the pandemic hit, they were doing some really great work around, um, uh, you know, occupational health and safety. So I think they were they were giving themselves a good connection to the workforce. But then organizing a strike is very different from getting people to sign a petition. And you know, I don't know what you do uh, with that. You know. Yeah, no, that's that's really um, interesting, and because like, I've always, you know, I've always said that I, you know, that it's it's lost a lot in the focus we have on this whole question of employment status and whether they are even employees. That the bigger question, the bigger challenge, as you just said, and I agree with you, is even if they can get unionized, the Wagner model system is going to make it so difficult for gig workers to bargain to first bargain mm -hmm. an effective collector agreement, but then just to enforce it um, and to mobilize a strike, you know, where there's, there's no workplace, there's no picket line really. Um, and so to, to me, you know, that, that is a question that's not, doesn't get a lot of focus yet. I mean, I, people who are in, in labor law and, and collective bargaining understand it, but there's certainly the public attention has been on this question of employment status and, 
But there is this much bigger question of whether you could even bargain a, an effective collective agreement under the way. Yeah. No, and I don't want to be a wet blanket. Maybe it's not the way to end it, but it's like, uh, although to be clear, I've got, I don't have a call to 11, so I'm, I'm yours, but uh, it's the benefit of having a day where you have know, an arbitration that goes away. But what I wanted to say is if you think back to, you know, I actually really got into the history of the independent contractor provision, trying to trace it all the way back. There's a reason why Wilson's decision starts with Harry Arthur's, because I was kind of, that was a drumbeat of my argument was that this isn't, you know, the gig economy it's a bit different because it's certainly not the same. The technology changes it a bit, but it's not all that different from what was happening in the sixties and seventies and eighties. But so if you look at the big fights there, you know, the taxi drivers, really, really exciting cases kind of throughout the eighties and nineties, but there are no taxi unions now. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and in terms of, I think one of the other interesting ones is the Toronto Star case, which to me is kind of, I think one of the greatest labor relations or Ontario Labor Relations Board decisions ever written is Chris Alberton's decision in the Toronto Star case. But that was a huge campaign to organize delivery people for the Toronto Star. And a lot of the old dependent contractor decisions involved newspaper carriers. You know, the Toronto Star farmed out that labor almost immediately, and there are no newspaper carrier unions nowadays. Um, and, there, and, and that's not just because of technology, even when newspapers were a bigger thing. There were no carrier unions. And you know, really with the exception of truck drivers and the Teamsters, I think by and large, you know, you have these fights over the event contractors and then they they don't seem to stick. So I think that's one of the big concerns. Yeah. Um, well, it's a really interesting topic. And like I said, it's just captured the imagination of the labor law community. And in, in my academic world, for instance, we have a drinking game at conferences where every time someone says gig work, you have to take a drink and uh, everyone's drunk by 9.30 a.m. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, you know, before that, it was agricultural workers. And like, yeah. so they're, you know, and all of these are important topics, but they get they get sexy um, and they become you know, this huge, you know, issue of the day. And this one doesn't seem to be going away, but um, we, I, I could talk about this all day, uh, but I think we need to wrap it up because we have right. another session coming up on concerted activities, which uh, would also potentially apply to gig workers. Yeah. This, yeah. You know, the, and what protections would they have of the, you know, the 450 of them uh, that wanted the union lose what, you know, what have they had the right now, of course, the gig work it goes back to this question of what's a strike by gig workers um, and what effect would it have? But um, I mean, we're dealing with they could be your test case. They I think they're, you know, they're ready to go and do some concerted activity. So, you know, uh, Fedora is, but uh, or at least the Fedora, the, the so-called food service there, you know, now that they're working elsewhere, they've still got a, a heavy duty campaign going on, not to organize, but just to you know, kind of uh, work through some of the industry's problems. So who knows, maybe we'll come back later on and talk about, uh, you know, them in a year when, when someone gets fired for leading a, a non-unionized strike. I'm waiting for that test case. Yeah. Um, get that's your kids to sign up for Uber Eats or get your kids to sign up for uh, some yeah, of those yeah. deliveries. My daughter's 17, so she's almost there. Yeah, well, I, I do really appreciate you guys. Uh, All right, thanks a lot, Ryan, for, uh, for joining us. Um, it was really interesting. Um, in fact, thank you so much. Uh, I'll talk to you later about this. I, Osgood's recording it, and I don't know uh, if uh, if we can make this little talk of, of publicly available. And I'll talk to you about whether you'd be prepared to do that, if that's possible, because I think yeah. it, it was really interesting. So that'd be great. All right. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Uh, okay, everyone, let's. Um, it's ten thirty.